of guests on it, um, we were just discussing during the break about children are so stressed out. So we're in a space where let's give all the stakeholders in education, let's give children um, techniques and the ability to be able to say, um, I'm not fearful, I'm not powerless, um, that I have um, the ability to step into my light and it doesn't matter what's happening in this world. And that's a really big thing because we can't just say that lightly. It's, it, it's a feeling. I'd like to um, introduce um, all the wonderful people joining me. And um, so we have Dr. Tom Acklin, who is also uh, moderating this panel. And um, I'm going to have to pin a few people. Um, let's see. This is a great learning curve. So I just want to pin our panelists. Um, okay, Phil Maycumber, um, Annie Spade, who I'm going to pin right now, um, Catherine, Kathy Woods. Okay. And um, I believe um, Maureen Diaz is also joining us. I'm not sure. Okay, right, here we go. While um, you're doing that, why don't I okay. pass the mic here? Uh, I think it would be appropriate um, to start with Annie, uh, if everybody's okay with that. Um, we have a rich group here, so we have an hour uh, and five different speakers, and we're each going to take six or seven minutes. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't think we're going to have time for live Q&A. Uh, so if you do have a question or a comment, please put that in the chat, and one of us will sculpt that for the speaker. Um, Annie comes from Montessori tradition. Thank you so much for being here, Annie. Um, and I, I love the way this bio is written. She chose the Montessori model because it fosters the child's sense of purpose and agency by honoring what Maria Montessori called the inner teacher. So Annie's been around the world. It would take me a, it would take me a year uh, to talk about who she is, but she's, uh, she's hanging out in Austin, uh, running a nonprofit school that's uh, got a bunch of happy kids who have eight acres to play on. So yeah. Annie, so glad you're here. And why don't you set the tone for um, what we what we all can point to as we uh, talk about our various interests in empowering the young, the next generations. Thank you for being here. Wow, thank you so much, Tom. <laughs> it's, it's so great to be here and to be in this this circle. Um, and I and I'm just. I always feel like after 40 years of being with young children day in and day out, and when I say young children, I'm speaking of children ages two to six in the Montessori Children's House, um, it really is the foundation. So I'm just, I'm, I'm honored and blessed that you would ask for this voice to be brought in first, Tom, and when I say, um, this voice, I'm speaking, the voice of, of the child. I uh, really feel that with these decades that I've had, um, it's, it's a gift to, um, to have had that time of deep listening to young children. And then my mission, if you will, my calling is to bring that voice into the world. And over and over, I'm, I'm hearing that from, from all sides that it really is our, um, our opportunity when we're born, <laughs> if I could put it that way, to enter the world as a kind of second womb. And so two years ago, I, um, it's in the archives for World Unity Week year one uh, that I offered something on children finding home in nature because truly the natural world is is our given second womb if you will when we're born and 
So when we talk about our children being um, challenged and stressed, I actually just heard of a dear three-year-old that lives near me in my neighborhood, a grandchild of a friend who uh, is very sick with COVID. And that news just came in just this morning. So I'm thinking, okay, now the children will really feel, you know, they've been wearing masks. They've been seeing masks for over two years, their entire lives, these young ones, a lot of them. And uh, now this, this is there as well. So what I like to focus on, though, is the way that we can nurture agency in our young children. And I just heard uh, Pat McCabe, Sister Pat McCabe, um, from one of the, the Native American tribes was, was uh, teaching in the plenary this morning on water. Uh, but within that, she said that, that joy is our birthright. And she said, joy comes through that sense of agency. And that's really, you, you referred to it, uh, Dr. Tom, just then, but <clears throat> that is what called me into Montessori because as a child, I, I sought to learn. I remembered that and I kept that flame alive as I grew. And so to bring that to young children. And so, you know, it begins with, I'm going to give y'all something really concrete, but you know, with the infant and you're dressing the infant and the, the, the little arm, the hand is pushing, you know, because they recognize the pattern of having their shirt put on. And so the hand starts to push. And so instead of just putting the shirt on the child, the infant in this case, you, you give the child only that help that they needed to find the hole and then that they would put their little arm through the, through the sleeve. I mean, it sounds very, very simple and archaic, but that's where it begins. Every way that we follow what Maria Montessori gave us that she spoke for the young child by her observation because she was trained as a scientist. She was trained as a medical doctor that the child is saying, help me to help myself. In other words, help me to find my own agency in life. And that's the beginning of it. I mean, people say, when does it begin? It begins essentially at birth. The Montessorians say when the child turns from the breast to see something in the room around them, that's the beginning of the child's very own participation in the world because it is about the individual uniqueness, but it's also about participation in the world. So I didn't time myself. I don't know if I'm out of time, but I probably am. So I'm gonna let, let it move on. Thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to hearing from oh, you. Annie, that is um, absolutely, and I've heard you say that before, but it's absolutely amazing. It's very fascinating um, where that agency begins. And it's such a great way for people to just know that. So when you working, let me ask you one question um, before we close, close off. Um, and if, if people, if that's the only thing that they get from this, I mean, Wow, that's amazing. The agency begins right in infancy. Um, but when you're working with your, your two-year-olds um, through to six-year-olds um, and you're talking about, well, joy is a birthright and how it resonated with you, um, what, what is one thing that you might teach them, just very quickly, one thing that you might teach them that really reiterates that oh well <laughs> well that's the thing I don't look at it as teaching joy because joy is something that 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 is a result of right and I've just over time my very first Montessori training was honestly in the catechesis of the good shepherd which you know was done from the Christian viewpoint but it was really to uncover the spiritual gifts of early childhood so these researchers worked within the Montessori model to understand the spiritual capacities of a young child. And once again, these are all of our birthright um, mm -hmm. and the foundation for all of our lives. So I'm going to give you a set of five, and I believe it really is a progression. So the first is awe, to be struck 
with allurement to something. And you think of a little toddler walking along the sidewalk and sees an insect. They're attracted to it, right? Okay, so that's the beginning. Now, if we hurry the child on, the child doesn't have a chance to get to go into wonderment. So we go all wonderment. Um, and then there's, there's the gratitude, there's the appreciation for it, which young children just naturally have and falling in love which the gratitude and the love kind of go together. And guess what flows out of that is joy, is joy. Yes. And honestly, you know, once again, you're allowing, you're nurturing when you allow the toddler to be in wonderment, to go to gratitude and falling in love with, that once again is agency. And, and that is exactly what Sister Patricia McKay pulled in this morning as the source of joy. So it's, it's allowing and nurturing all of that for the individual, like supporting that is, is what we need to be about, I believe, for one another. And going back, because so many of us have lost that sense of, of agency and purpose in our lives, right? But it it's continues to be a hunger in our lives. Uh, that is powerful, really powerful. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, and now um, introducing Phil uh, and um, Phil Maycumber. She's on um, the board of Leave No Girl Behind International, um, the, the um, organization that my sister Shamima and I run. And Phil is an international education specialist. She, she works all over the world. Um, from South Africa, Saudi Arabia, the UK, the USA, um, other countries. And um, she has developed this four-step program. She believes that any child can learn, every child can learn. And um, Phil, uh, yeah, I just want to introduce you. And um, let's just uh, pick up that thread and um, think about, well, how do we, you work with, with children in a different capacity, teaching them that they can learn, how can they have agency in that matter, um, especially now that um, we're in times where they do feel fearful, they feel out of control or lost, and then comes the moment that they feel this learning isn't so easy and I'm stressed. Thank you, Hasina. Um... You know, I think that there are two things that we need to discuss. One of them is that because the state of affairs in education has been tipping more toward the side of stress, anxiety, burnout, the feeling of being overwhelmed, that teachers have lost the joy of teaching, regardless of their geographic location. And when teachers lose the joy of teaching, children lose the joy of learning. There is no way to disconnect that. It is connected because it is all about energy and mindset. You know, there was a story that I had seen on the news and it was of a young man who was hearing impaired slash deaf and he had fallen into almost like a sinkhole or like a, a mine, so to speak. And he kept looking up and all these people were around, you know, the news cameras, the lights going down, all of that. And he couldn't hear what people were saying. And they were just like, oh, you know, this is what, th what he saw. And he was finally rescued. They thought that it was not possible and they saved his life. So a sign language interpreter was there when he was being interviewed, young man, young adult, and said, how did you never give up hope? And his response was because he couldn't hear all the negative comments about he's never gonna get out of there. How are they going to save him? He's gonna freeze to death. He couldn't hear any of that. And it was at such a distance that he couldn't read the lips, right? And his response was, because everyone believed in me. 
There you have it. Our words are powerful. So the joy of teaching brings the joy of learning. And also, let's go back to voice and honoring children's voices. Because every child should have a sense of belonging in their school, in their classroom, in their family, in their community. And they should feel that they are valued and can add value at whatever potential and whatever level they are at, whether it is struggling with learning, whether it is not struggling and I'm doing okay, or it's, wow, I do really well, give me more. So regardless of whatever level that is, kids need to do one thing, believe in themselves. And it is our job to help them believe not only in their ability, but also in the ability that they can change things because everyone has the ability to change anything. You know, I believe that that's my belief system. We do not need to accept things the way they are, especially if they're not working. Yeah, that, that is so um, amazing. And just um, a, a quick, quick question. Um, what is your advice? How, do, how could an educator give that message? Maybe just one application or something. I think every day, every lesson, we need to go through an exercise of what I describe as an I can statement. So I can add numbers together to be able to learn addition. I can write a meaningful sentence. I can do a research paper. The I can or I am statements in life are extremely powerful and they are so easy to incorporate in education. But I think what we end up finding is that as we evolve as adults, even from our own childhood, that's when we reach out for self-help books, increasing our own you know, social consciousness in life, being able to build our own self-esteem, when really that should have happened in our education, right? We shouldn't just be seeking out that kind of information after we have like molded our development, it needs to be a part of our development. So I would say for anyone who teaches, and I describe teaching as we are all educators, whether you are around a classroom table or a kitchen table as parent, okay? We're all educators and we need to be able to build that into any lesson we teach children. Yeah. Uh, that, that's so powerful. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. My pleasure. And now that going to, to me, uh, if, if I could jump in here for a second, it means a lot to me. Um, is that okay? And, and I'll, uh, I'll use that as a bridge actually to talk uh, for a couple of minutes and then I'll introduce Maureen. Uh, I have a phrase, Phil, food is leadership. And Mm -hmm. uh, briefly for anybody listening, um, uh, Tom Acklin, by the way, uh, Frederick, Maryland, East Coast, US, U United States. And because we're on the one stream, I forgot about that. And uh, I, I came out of poisoning people in the allopathic medical system uh, and realized uh, very, very soon after I started paying attention to food about 15 or 20 years ago, um, that a lot of the ways we were toxifying our kids uh, was leading to the behavior problems. And I, I, like to, I like to suggest that the body's always doing the right thing. And it's, it's, you, can't, you can't push a rope, right? And a, and a kid who has been poisoned uh, and does, literally does not have the physiologic or the mental capacity, the emotional capacity, the psychological capacity to pay attention, uh, is, is not teachable. And so we can talk about infrastructure tweaking and it's a nice idea. Uh, and, uh, 
there is a huge, huge, huge traction to be gained with all of these powerful ideas and institutional uh, tweaks that we're putting together when we put the body in order, right? And when we put the body and the brain in order. So I'll be talking on Thursday uh, more, more deeply about this at noon uh, in, this con in this convergence room. And, uh, but I like to call it food as leadership. You know, where we are connected, we are well. And, and kids are craving, craving, craving. They were, uh, they were craving connection, you know, before we closed down the planet. And uh, personally, I think we've done a huge disservice with, uh, with a lot of the distancing and whatnot. We've also done a lot of distance, distancing, and I'll use this to introduce Maureen. We've done distancing from the uh, natural ecosystem uh, of hunter-gatherer seeking food not just the stuff that we chew and swallow, but uh, that which we, when we find each other, right? We can look at each other today and we can, we can know that we are connected uh, and each of us is a food and each of us uh, uh, seeks a food, right? And again, not just nourishment, but in all of our walkings. And uh, so let me pause there. I'll have a couple of comments I know Maureen, uh, such a well-traveled longtime voice uh, for the Weston A. Price Foundation and uh, so grateful that you're here. Um, each of us is minister, I suppose. Yeah, some of us are ordained and some of us are not. And you have a, a beautiful organization called God's Good Table, which is an outreach. And uh, you and your wonderful, playful family live in the mountains of Virginia. So I, I'm so Please, this is, uh, this, is, this is a great gift that you could spend a few time, a few minutes with us. Thank you for being here today. Why don't you unmute and, and uh, take off? You could tell us, if, you're muted. You could tell us as a beginning how you met Sally uh, and what the Weston A. Price Foundation is and then where you'd like to see all this hap happening. Okay. Well, um, I have been a lifelong learner, continue to be, and will be till the day I die. And one thing that has fascinated me above and beyond anything else in my life has been the idea of nutrition for initially physical health um, and understanding, seeing that, uh, that the food that we eat directly corresponds to our physical health. And as time went on, I learned it also has everything to do with our mental and emotional health. So... Um, at the urging of a friend, um, I eventually bought Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon Morell, and then I uh, attended a conference in which she was speaking and began a, a long and very warm friendship with her. She's one of my biggest teachers in my life, and I'm very grateful to her for starting the Weston A. Price Foundation, writing the Nourishing Traditions book, and, and keeping the lines of communication over um, open for all of us. So she's a great mentor and friend. Um, but as, as time goes on, uh, and I've learned more about the research of Dr. Weston A. Price many years ago, and, and I take it out and I teach it, um, I want to say that in my own family, I homeschooled. What has already been said resonates deeply with me. I love the Montessori method. I've been both a homeschool teacher with two kids still at home schooling out of, uh, we've, we have nine. Um, but also then also having taught for two years in a private Christian school, which I may go back to next year, I haven't decided. Um, but when I'm in that school situation, the kids there even being brought up in good homes and many not in not so good homes, I'm seeing in particular how food and environment affects the mental health as well as the physical health of our children. Um, my children, grew up just like the Montessori model. I'd fling open the door in the morning and they'd run outside with their butterfly nets and their books to identify this, that, and the other thing. We foraged for food. We raised our own food. Our kids had a great life growing up on the farm in Pennsylvania. Um, but we moved to Virginia and things changed. So eventually we came to this private school situation, which is an excellent private school. However, I saw firsthand how appalling these children were being fed physically with physical food and how it affects their mental health. And then I looked beyond that to the world around us and began to understand food, food is medicine. I think we can all agree on that, but food is also our poison. 
And it grieves me greatly, whether it's kids in a United States classroom or children being fed with worldwide resources in famine stricken areas of Africa or anywhere in the world, the food that we're feeding children and families is causing very real damage to brains, to the mental health and the social health of communities. And that disturbs me greatly. Um, I've been teaching for many years now uh, about nutrition, accurate nutrition information, um, teaching people how to grow food, how to prepare food, and why food is important. Now I'm trying to reach further out and find ways to help the world at large to understand we have to go back to traditional food ways and abandon all of this process destructive food that I don't even call it all food, food in quotes, because it's damaging every individual, whether we realize it or not. How about all these school shootings, um, the, the mental health, the people on the street living in homeless shelters or in tents who have very, very significant brain damage that just continues because we're feeding them total garbage, stuff that shouldn't be fed even, even in many cases to animals. Um, so Dr. Price, of course, studied cultures around the world. He made the connection between his patients declining oral and physical health with the food supply. I think we need to go back to this. There are many things we can do generally within our own homes, such as creating a safe quiet space, um, unplugging the Wi-Fi, turning off the devices, sitting at the dinner table together after working as a, as a family to produce a good meal and then to clean it up when we're done. But then it's so empowering to our children when we take that outside of our own four walls. Um, one thing that I think is super important that we teach our own children and then take that into the classroom and take it into the world is that first we need to listen. We need to listen to others. We need to develop empathy. We need to consider what people are just trying so hard to say that we're not hearing. And then we need to find ways to be proactive, to be leaders. And that can start with the meals, of course, because nutrition is my thing, the meals that we serve people, but then um, going out into the community and trying to help others, including, for instance, I'll just give us a very simple example that any of us can do. Everywhere we go, there are homeless people on the street. There are people asking for, for money, for handouts. Um, I've always believed in a hand up, not a handout, but I, instead of handing out money, I prefer to keep nutritious food like Epic bars, uh, you know, things like that that are easy. Or I'll drive to a uh, Chipotle and buy a meal and take it to the guy on the corner and ask him, how are you doing? What's your story? Um, we, that's part of developing empathy. And I can tell you it has had a big impact on my children. Um, I don't do this to show off. This is what we all need to be doing and I'm showing it to my children. When their friends are in the car with me, they're seeing it. When we go out to the churches and we go out to conferences and we go out anywhere we go, they need to see that we're not just saying, oh yeah, another homeless person or oh yeah, another screwed up family. They need to see us actively participating and being part of the solution. And yeah. that we, we just have to do that instead of just donating and I donate, but we need to be proactive and we need to be proactive in front of the children who are impressionable around us so that they can hear and see and learn from us. We need to be the example for others. Beautiful. Well, thank you for being the example. Um, let me reflect one one of your one of your thoughts there. 
uh, when I met you. Uh, Maureen and I were lucky enough to meet uh, at a Sally Fallon event uh, just a couple of months ago um, at the Cool Font Resort in West Virginia, by the way, Berkeley Springs, um, hosting fantastic conscious events. And uh, I resonated with your with your suggestion that we stop calling most of the stuff that we put in our kids mouths food mm -hmm. do you have if you could wave your magic wand do you have any favorite ways of describing that because i get up on my band box all day long about that and yeah. uh it's you know we have endocrine dis disruptors we have antibiotics we have we have slaughtered trans fats we have things that are that are not organic deliverables and organic you know doesn't necessarily mean what we think of in the you know on the label but it does bring life and to, to not eat something that to eat something that's not organic means uh, we're slaughtering ourselves. That's I think we can't get, right. And I don't know that we can totally get away from it right now, but we can start, we can start poking and start nudging and uh, move towards some different language. So what's, what are some of your favorite things to say about that? Well, my key thing that I always say is that food should come from farms, not factories, or it can come from your backyard. But organic is just a label. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's good for you. So I try to teach people, uh, as Joel Salatin says, beyond organic. Um, food, again, can be poison or it can be medicine. And medicine, by the way, if you think about food as medicine, every bite that we put into our mouths should be medicine in that it builds our health, physical health, mental health, and social health. So I start with, um, I, I often say I'm a Christian and I say God didn't create, he created the earth, the plants, the animals, and all of this, but he didn't give us factories. So we need to go back to how things were in the beginning. And every culture around the world has a rich history, a rich food history. And, you know, if we listen to our governments, we're being told things that are very antagonistic against food culture, traditional food culture, and actual physical health and mental health. So I do encourage people to stop buying things that have a label. Um, if you can't grow your own, and I think most of us can grow at least some of our own food. I'm, I, I'm privileged to have an atrium. I'm sitting in my atrium. So all year long, I actually grow some food. But even if it's a pot on the deck or the patio, we need to grow some of our own food, experience what it is to, to see something growing that we've planted with our own hands. Um, we need to go back to local food systems where we're purchasing our eggs from our neighbor if we don't have chickens of our own, or we can get our meat and our vegetables from local farms instead of from the grocery store. Um, I do have one grocery store that I love in my area, and it has a lot of local, locally sourced produce and, and other things. So even if I can't find what I need at my local farm stand, at least I can go to this other and and, um, and I can find locally sourced food. Locally sourced food is going to be the most nutritious because it's closest from source to delivery. Love it. Um, but, but we can do so much, you know, I'd rather see fences and sheep and goats than somebody out mowing a massive lawn. That gets me. You always hear that we cannot feed the world. And that's baloney. Stop mowing lawns. Stop building massive buildings with massive lawns that do nothing but get receive chemicals and then get mowed. But instead, like at the school where I taught, I taught the kids there how to grow vegetables. We're talking about putting in a chicken coop and maybe putting up a fence and growing some meat. But it's important that, that we all become involved in what we put into our bodies and our children's bodies. And in that we have a very direct impact upon mental health, emotional health, community health, world health. And I Amen. think instead of giving handouts, we should be giving hand up through uh, organizations like Heifer International. You know, I, one of my favorite organizations that goes into the world and helps people 
provide for themselves. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Amen. Well, I don't need to say anything. I knew well, I knew when I met you, Maureen, that we were going to run on the same ticket. Um, you you say everything that uh, uh, from your from your mouth to God's ears. Let's just let's just say that, right? And uh, I, I know everybody on the uh, on the stream here is resonating with your energy. And you were, by the way, a very uh, I'm very grateful that you were a bonus addition. So if anybody's on the co-creators board. Uh, Maureen's contact information is not there. So Maureen, if you would put your contact information in the sure. chat, please. And I also wanted to presence for people when we're talking about local, uh, I'm a big advocate too of, uh, you know, meet your farmers, uh, buy, buy food that hasn't been away from mother earth for very long, right? Pick it up. If you don't have it in the backyard, go find it somewhere. And you can go to farmmatch.com, type in your zip code and you'll find uh, Weston A. Price-ish farms, uh, good local dairy. Um, well, even Weston A. Price Price for more info. Yeah. We have chapters all over the world. And I'll be talking more about this on Thursday as well, uh, Thursday at noon. Uh, we'll dive deeper into that. But just one quick thing, since we are uh, going to uh, hear from Kathy and Hasina about mental health and um, advocacy for kids as uh, as they step away from the the abuse right and not just systemic abuse uh, for whatever that means for you when you hear the word abuse uh, wipe that away for a moment I would invite everybody to wipe that away and realize when we are not eating things that are close to mother earth we have abused ourselves right the further away it is uh, from being alive, the longer it's been alive, not been alive, uh, the less it's suggesting something to you, the less it becomes a teacher for the body, right? The less it brings uh, metabolic flexibility and, and uh, regenerative capacity. So autism didn't exist 100 years ago, with rare exceptions. Autoimmune disease did not exist 100 years ago. Uh, cancer didn't exist 100 years ago. Um, I don't know if I introduced myself, by the way, I'm an, I'm a multiple sclerosis specialist, neurologist, uh, practiced at Georgetown and, uh, told people how they were going to degenerate for many, many years. Right. I do things very differently today. And, uh, if I'm, I'm here to tell you, I can say this on this platform, um, autoimmunity is perfectly reversible. Uh, everything from Crohn's disease to Hashimoto's to, uh, to MS. And I, I like saying there's nothing happening in the MS in the multiple sclerosis brain. That's not happening in my brain with one exception. My body has the ability to take out the trash. So I do microbiome rebuild. We put gut health together. We put metabolic flexibility together. We put immune competence back together and uh, all things are possible with real food, but the first order of business is stop poisoning. Yeah. So uh, we're going to hear a bunch of different poisons. Thank you for letting me babble on and I'm going to toss it back to Hasina, why don't you introduce Kathy? I could rave about her, uh, but you've known her longer, so you can rave about her longer. So why don't I, uh, why don't I let you introduce her? Yes, I'd love to rave about Kathy. Well, Kathy is a lifelong educator. She's advocated for children's social and emotional health and wellness in their learning environments. So it's really fitting that she speaks right now, um, just after Maureen spoke about, um, you know, abuse and emotional health. And this is such a great segue that Kathy's work has also focused on ensuring equal access to quality educational opportunities for all students, especially those with disabilities. Um, Kathy has presented nationally on inclusion of students with disabilities, strategic planning, the use of universal design for learning in transition programs, and educational leadership. So, Kathy, I welcome you. And I've known firsthand sometimes, you know, you really go to the mat for the kids. So um, what I'd like to really focus on is um, getting to that emotional health and um, how you feel that kids should be advocated for, not just by the, the teachers, educational stakeholders, by the parents as well. Um, yeah, just. Tell me some of your thoughts on that. You're muted. 
And what I said was, we don't have enough time for me to express <laughs> all my opinions about that. You know, I was struck as you were uh, reading my bio of all the labels that are in there. And I've been struck through this whole conversation about the number of labels that we use um, in public education and especially in my world as a director of student services. Most of my work is about labels. Children have this or that condition and upon which we define then an educational disability upon which we define the educational resources that they require. But they're not the only kids who receive labels in our system. And the same is true for the teachers and the parents, of course. Um, but the children who maybe once had a bad day and it was called bullying, they then are a bully forever. Then there are those parents, <laughs> those being a very vague word, but it could be those parents who are really advocating for their children or those parents who really someone defined as not doing a particularly good job. Uh, as a parent. Um, the labels we use are so amazingly important, as are the other types of words that we use, whether we're describing events in a child's life, or we're describing the interventions that we're going to take to help resolve those uh, events. Uh, children now come to school with a wide variety of trauma events in their lives. We had a three-year-old arrive at our doorstep looking for special education for a mental health diagnosis that had to do with their ability, there being the three-year-old's ability to deal with uh, a traumatic event. And I thought, my God, what, what? could have happened in a three-year-old's life who has both biological parents. I mean, all these labels again, that define what a child should come to school with. Well, it turns out that this child has all the right supports, but there was a very, very bad dog attack that took place in their backyard where he and his mother were kind of, um, got in a corner and they couldn't leave the corner and they both watched as the father tried to take the dogs apart and do all that. And this child uh, continued to have difficulty with reacting to that bad event. Now, none of us would have ever guessed that something like that would have happened in that child's life. We tend to think of trauma, another label, as abuse that has taken place, whether it's verbal or physical or sexual, we tend to think of homelessness as a trauma event. We tend to think of uh, not knowing where your next meal is going to come from as a trauma event. It could be anything. It could be that their favorite fish uh, had to have a funeral over the weekend. You know, I mean, I'm being a little glib, but we have no idea. As someone earlier said, we have to listen and we have to ask lots and lots of questions. As a lifelong learner, that is my style. I ask questions to the point where people get a little tired of me digging in for all those details that I want, because I want to learn more about what it is that's going on. But there's the then what, then what do we do? We need to really be mindful of the interventions that we put in place so that we are not adding to that trauma, that we are not causing dysregulation in the mental health system of that individual. We need to be as mindful as we are now teaching kids to be and not just be the grown-ups who know all the right answers because we don't. 
everybody's situation is different. What is a trauma to one child may not be a trauma to another child. Uh, but children are coming to us now, us meaning in public schools, with many, many labels that have been placed upon them based on their parents reporting. And sometimes the older the child gets from their child's own reporting of what's going on with them. And all of a sudden you have these huge, you know, major diagnoses put on children. And then they come to school and we expect them. There are still teachers who expect kids to sit in a hard seat and, you know, kind of consume the information that's being, you know, put out there to fill their empty vessel of a head. Um, and, you know, we as educational leaders work every day to make sure that we are helping to educate those teachers who are still acting in that way. Since the pandemic, what I can say is that the pandemic, right? I don't even need to say much about it except the one word because the one word covers it all. Except that I think public educators, that's my world, so that's what I stick to. Public educators have become much more mindful about what it is they are teaching to children and they are becoming better at listening asking questions, teaching children to ask questions about what they're labeling. My five-year-old granddaughter one day said, I'm a little human. And I fell in love with her teacher who I don't even know who it is just because she had taught my granddaughter to think of herself in that way. I'm a little human. What a much better label that is than to say they're from the other side of the tracks. Oh, I'm showing my age with that one, but you get the point. Um, we need to teach our children who they are in this world. And I think that since the pandemic, educators in general are doing a much better job at that. The pandemic caused mindfulness, I think, in most people. And there continue to be things we can control and things we can't. And isn't that the best lesson that we can teach our young children? That, that is so beautiful. Um, uh, what you said about a trauma to one child is not a trauma to another child. That is so um, apt. And yet sometimes we tend to be so cookie cutter. You know, adults tend to be so cookie cutter with the expectations. Um, and the asking of questions, just fostering that asking of questions, which leads me to if we nurtured that and if that was a normal thing would we be in the situation in the world where we are now where we um we just accept things because we don't ask questions we don't ask why why is this true where's the evidence where's the science and what can we believe so kathy you know Oh, the, the techniques that you've just given to um, parents out there and to um, adults out there, stakeholders in education um, about, well, remember, children are individuals and trauma to one child is not trauma to another and, you know, ask the questions. So I just like to reiterate that. And um, what I'd like to say from my point of view is that, when my sister and I um, uh, lead our organization, Leave No Girl Behind International, our focus is on leadership. And that's something where we foster that, you know, ask the questions. People are individuals and um, just be in the space as yourself, be in the space as you. And if you don't know who you are, then that's where the child gets to discover that. And we need to open the path for the children to be able to discover um, such things, to discover who they are. Maybe this whole, dis this whole discussion, ending it here, is about 
what is sacred education and i think all all our speakers here thank you so much phil annie um kathy maureen and of course it's an honor always to facilitate a discussion with um chum um i just think that education is a sacred thing not just school education but all education for our kids and if we just use these techniques we can you know just do something a little something every single day because every day counts every day makes our children who they are and in 18 years they have an impression of the world they've taken on our fears and our insecurities um so we get to make the difference so thank you so much and please um kathy phil annie um, put your put your contact information in the chat. It's also on the Trello board, Maureen. I know you've put yours there, um, but people may want to contact you and you're all such amazing speakers and givers of information. So Tom, I'll hand it over to you if there's anything you want to say. Oh, we could go for hours and hours. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful to commune and... One of the catchphrases, uh, which is on the back of our business cards here, is uh, humanity as organism thrives. And uh, where we are together, we are where, well, where we are separate. Uh, therein is the beginning of whatever pathology you're specialized in, right? If you're a teacher, then it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an inability to pay attention. If you're a, a social worker, it's an inability to uh, navigate momentum uh, on an emotional path and on and on and on. And we are all healers, uh, whether you don't need, in fact, the people with the letters behind their name, uh, uh, I, I have to honor uh, everybody here who has put in such beautiful academic pursuit. Um, if you came through that avenue, we had a very rich conversation yesterday about dismantling the social fabric of the conversation We've, we've got a momentum of a conversation in this country that says uh, that if, you're, if your skill set is technical, whether you're a scientist or a lawyer or a, a teacher or an academician or, a, you know, uh, if, you, if, you have an, if you came through school, uh, that somehow you can't be spiritual. And uh, that also is, is dissolving. And we, we can all bring spirit into our skill set. And I think that's, a, that's what we're about to talk about next here. Kim Conrad's gonna join us for the next session. Um, those of you who are with us on the live stream, thank you, on the one stream, thank you so, so much. Uh, we are in the co-creators convergence. Uh, what are we calling it, text? The, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, co-creators village, co-creators convergence. Co-creators global village. Global village, thank you. Global indeed. And uh, we were in a great seminar uh, last week where the moderator welcomed people as they popped in and, and he said, uh, it's great to see everybody. Uh, for some of you, for some of you, it's morning, for some of you, it's afternoon, for some of you, it's, uh, middle of the night. And so we've got light from all over the planet. And I think that would be a really nice way to close is we have light all over the planet. Uh, and each of, each of you is that, and I honor you for bringing who you are to this, this gathering. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have stopped the recording and I think we've we've got um, about three more minutes and then our our sacred freedom panel starts. And John is here again. Uh, let's see if uh, those of you who are not part of this, apologies for uh, 90 seconds of administrative talk. If John's got some feedback. From... No, no, I'm here. Just to want to make sure you guys oh, okay. know what you need. Didn't, just... didn't know if you needed us to do anything for the stream. Well, are we going to stop the stream, are you guys, with this session? Well, that's up to you, John. Um, we, we're good whichever way. All right, hold on. Let me make sure I know what this was to go. Be from, careful which one, one, you know right, right. This I'll was a one hour. 
I'll take a megaphone any day. I think, uh, you know, anybody okay, on this, okay, okay. Anybody on this platform will take a microphone and uh, we'll, 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 we'll go. Okay. <laughs> if you promise me you're going to offer inspiring, uplifting words to help our world at this time, keep the stream going. I can't see why we'd stop. Right, guys? You're doing such good work. Wow, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. That, all right. Um, I am just going to pin our other speakers. Oh, there you are. Now, when you say pin, that's different than spotlighting. You know that? Uh, yes. And I don't, I know Noel was telling us that. And the question I didn't ask was, what is the difference? All right. I'm going to answer that. It's a big deal. Okay. The okay. way you set up the pins shows it to you that way. Uh -huh. But if you're the host, like you are, when you spotlight someone, that's what goes out on the live stream. And everyone then sees it. Like, for instance, right now, spotlight text. Go ahead. Right by okay. him. And select spotlight for everyone. And you're going to see what happens. That's okay. totally. Pinning is just your own personal. Look at that. There he is. The one and only. Spotlight. Oh. Oh, right? Birthday, brother. So now you got to remove the spotlight. Okay. Oh, right? See that? But spotlighting, especially when you're the host, it's what's on your screen is what goes out on the live stream. So you're okay. operating the view and controlling. Still, everyone's seeing text. There's a little okay. place. Remove spotlight. Yeah. See that? There you yep. go. I'm and now, now you just have in speaker view because Tom spoke. That's why Tom appeared. So the pinning is not doing anything for others. It's just for yourself. Oh, Thank you. I needed that education. <laughs> well, I, there you go. I knew I got up this morning for a reason. <laughs> Jack, so can, oh, Jack. Oh, I have one question for for John. Like I copied the uh, the uh, one stream uh, URL there to go and check uh, where it's, it's happening. And uh, apparently it should be on the World Unity Week uh, Facebook page. And there I saw that uh, this uh, session was actually on for only about five minutes. Like I didn't see the whole session on the It's Facebook. there. If something happened, it started and started again. Okay. So it's there. And it's on, if you go to uh, the one dot stream, which is the, the website. Okay. You should see yourself and me and me you talking right now. All right. Okay. okay, guys, keep it going. It looks like you can do it for another hour. Then there's a, another event that's happening then. So let me let you keep going. Awesome. Thank you. Um, last question, uh, John. So if we're spotlighting, is it only one person? Because right now I've got four of us pinned, and I'm guessing if I record, it will go out like that from the recording. No, if I no, spotlight. No, 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 the pins do not do that. And you can add okay. more than one person to a spotlight. Okay, so let's do it. Let's spotlight Danielle. Okay. It's and then spotlight. add X or add Tom, either one. You've not yet done it. Okay. So the spotlight. Yeah, the, oh, there you go. Okay. Right. Okay, um, we're good you now. Hi, you're spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> add Tom right. or add X. You can add um, to the spotlight. You see that? You can have two people spotlighted. Oh. So if you click. Tom, I'm not seeing you spotlighted. Are you spotlighted? Danielle is. Oh, okay. Now, I don't have I don't have an option to spotlight Tom. Um, okay. How are you doing? Are you going to the participants tab and then yes. the three dots right next to that person? Yeah, I'm. I'm going to the person's uh, to the person's picture and the three dots right there. But yeah, what oh, is okay, that? I've got it now. Okay. Add me. So well, add, there you go. Now you got. Now you got two people spotlighted. Okay, so let me spotlight our our speakers right now. So right. text, you want to say something? He raised his hand. Now he's waving. He just needs to no, lower. His hand no, I'm talking. okay. Thank you. So he needs to lower his hand or you need to lower it for him. Well, so, Sina, I've got a question. Oh, sorry. Yes, Danielle. I just want to know, um, am I one of the youngest people on the Zoom call? I'd say you are right now. I would say oh, you wow. are. 
Wow. Okay, now it was just a question. I was just, I was just <laughs> curious. That tells me a lot. Okay. What Never does mind. It tell Thank you. you. I want to learn from you. What does it tell you? It tells me that there's not enough people in my generation wanting to learn about themselves and create their mindset to the fullest capacity that it can probably be. And I have this drive, I don't know what it is, but I have this drive that I want to become the fullest version of myself. And the only way I can do that is by surrounding myself with people like this who can help me, who I can learn from and who can teach me. So it, it's shocking to me that my generation, there's not enough of my generation on here, but there's a lot. No, I don't want to say your generation. <laughs> I don't want to be horrible or make it come across as being horrible. No, that's but there's fine. A lot of, there's well, a lot of girls. No, but you're right. Uh -huh. you see, our responsibility is to allocate resources back to you. That's our job. So you're absolutely right. And, and But it was Picasso who said, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life mm -hmm. is to give it away. You found your gift. You're the voice of your generation. You need to go get your other generation. We need to come together. But we ha you should come to us and say, hey, wait a minute, guys. You're supposed to be helping us. That's our responsibility to you and your generation. That's the way it flows in the natural order of things. So it's great, Danielle, that you have the enthusiasm for your own life as an expression of what's possible. Bravo to you. We have much to, we're mutual mentors. We need to learn from your generation. We're all in this. Yeah, I've been told people together. learn from me. So imagine that learning from a 19 year old. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's something. <laughs> Well, hey, I'm learn. I learn from babies. I'll tell you, we, we got you know, age is wisdom doesn't come with age. I don't believe that. I've met a lot of old people who seem to be really immature, and a lot of young people who seem really wise. So, all right, I'm gonna get out of your hair here. One suggestion, if I may, a quick suggestion: we yeah. should stop uh, like uh, differentiating the young people and the not. So I think we just call them the younger people. Like I am young. I call my children now the younger ones. You know? Right. I think you're absolutely right, Tex. I mean, I'm not you're going anywhere yet. Right, right. I'm in. Well, I think that's a great note to start the Sacred Freedom panel. And John, thank you for your um, words. Danielle came through uh, my sister and my Leave No Girl Behind International School of Leadership. So um, she's a young leader. And I do think we can learn from our young leaders. And this panel we're about to start is to do with sacred freedom. This is something we all strive towards our young leaders, especially the, the younger generation techs. I'm using the younger people. Um, often all, what they want is freedom. So let's just start off with this. And I'd like to um, introduce the, the other um, uh, presenters here. Um, so first, yeah, You're I'm a fellow troublemaker. troublemaker. <laughs> well, why don't I start with you <laughs> for anyone who's just started watching, um, this panel of sacred freedom in the humanity as organism thrives convergence room within the co-creators global village. Um, this discussion is for different people. And uh, we love the interaction. Uh, so our first presenter, um, Dr. Tom Acklin. Uh, mm. Tom has been, well, I, I'm going to introduce you. <laughs> you, can, you can introduce me. <laughs> Tom has... Um, May I say a quick he, thing? Have we started he, recording? Did you want to record? I have recorded. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank Go you. <laughs> so... Um, Yes, Tom has um, not written a prescription in over a decade. He is um, a, a regenerative neurologist and functional medicine doctor. And um, with one thing that I love about um, Tom is that he feels that becoming the next best version, which means that this version and everything you say becomes irrelevant, that evolution is so key. 
Um, I just love that about him. And um, his, his teachings reflect food as leadership, gut brain health, um, the fact that every condition can, is reversible. If you weren't born with it, it's reversible, um, which gives so many people so much hope. And going into the sacred freedom panel, um, the one thing Tom speaks to is claiming your sovereignty through health. So um, we're just going to have a discussion. I'm going to introduce um, Elise Campbell as well. Um, I asked Elise to uh, join us the other day and um, we were looking at her bio and Elise, I would love to just read your bio because it is so unique and I think it's great. It's something that we can all relate to. Um, Elise Campbell believes above all else in listening to her inner voice. She's doing her best to raise three compassionate and fulfilled human beings while serving her fine art portrait photography clients with heart and dedication. As a late blooming lesbian and a teacher by nature who changed careers and left the world of education, Elise has had a unique life's path so far. She's relied a lot on believing that things would work out before they did. And she took many leaps of faith in life because she knew she had the love and support of family and friends. She's learning to embrace her sensitivity as a gift and lean into her own guidance to serve herself and her loved ones. And that is key to claiming sovereignty too. And that's brilliant. And then I would love to introduce Kim Conrad. We had um, Kim speaking with us um, just the other day. And um, yeah. Excuse me, I'm having a glitch in my technology as I read your bio, Kim. So um, just give me one second. <laughs> you can just share something about me rather than read it. If yes, you like. That's fine. well, I'd love to. I would love to. Um, Kim speaks about the power of words to create, and she speaks to what energy you can create when using those words. She has been on platforms with um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, She's um, spoken about peace and healing and unity all around the world. She's rebuilt her own life and her own body three times. And for me, I love watching what Kim brings out from other people. Last year at World Unity Week, I attended one of her um, presentations and I had such a huge aha moment. So Kim, I'm going to introduce you like that. It's a very unique introduction. Maybe the universe wanted me to do that. Um, and yeah, um, we can start off with what sacred freedom means to each of us. I've talked too much. Tom, would you like to do the honors? One of the reasons I was hesitant to speak is because uh, I have lots of notes and lots of talking points and bullet points and things. And I, uh, in your beautiful session earlier, uh, I got that I was, well, I'll tell you what I wrote. I'll share with you. Uh, that I am a, a dissembler and thread assembler, right? And I like to play with words. And I also wrote that I'm a poet and neologist, ne neologistic, uh, neologistician. Neologism is new word, uh, right? A new a neologism is, is so neologistician. I think is probably a neologism. Uh, and what I was looking forward to doing is listening to people in a very sacred way. And I think that's one of the, one of the tenets of this whole platform is our intercreation. And there are so many beautiful messages about uh, meeting the darkness or meeting the pain or meeting the thing and finding different ways to express that, right? The unexpressed pain becomes a trauma. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I'll throw something in because it's important to me and not speaking it. If I'm actually going to walk the, walk the talk of what I just said, not saying what I'm about to say would have been a trauma. 
Um, so I'm a neurologist and I deal with a lot of neuropathies and shingles and re reactivations of old things that like to live in nerve roots, right? When a critter gets in there and lives in a nerve root, uh, chickenpox virus, for example, in this case, uh, it hangs out in there uh, for decades and major trauma happens and then boom, out comes shingles. I think we all know that dynamic. Similar dynamics like that happen uh, when we don't speak the truth. And for me, sacred freedom is having, uh, letting uh, our, our younger generations and now our older generations too, we were, I think we were all probably, well, we're all raised in whatever cage we're raised in, right? We're all, and we're all uh, told to be polite and find our manners and uh, step into a place where uh, we can be a uh, contribution to society. But very rarely is that on the kids' terms. It's on the society's terms. And I think we're in a place right now in the past couple of years, it's really been happening for the better part of a century, but we're reaching a crescendo. And I think this platform is so beautifully timed uh, this week. And, you know, here we are at the end of almost three years of this uh, really squ squeeze, squeeze, squeeze oppression. And uh, the truth will come out and we don't know what it's going to look like yet, but we're all going to find new language. We're all going to find neologisms and we're going to find new ways to say things that we uh, have been suppressed, right? We've been latent virus. Each of us, when we don't speak, we're a latent virus. And then the real question is, okay, well, if you have a truth that's burning in your, in your belly, uh, if you don't say it now, it's going to come out somewhere, right? I think it's a powerful conversation. I think it's enough for now. And um, actually, Kim and I had a great conversation a couple of weeks ago. Um, that was in, in that realm. So why don't I pass to you, Kim, because you, you do so much resolution work and you help people face the truth of things, uh, you know, on their terms. And I think it's, uh, one of the, one of the skill sets that is not taught us in school is how to be of service and how to be a servant leader. Uh, and most servant leader you know i wasn't educated that way i was educated in uh you're going to do it my way right not just in my family and i came from a great family but I, it was a military family and a, but educated into a prescriptive top-down expert has the answers mentality those dynamics are gone right this is this is a, a ecosystem this is a brand new petri dish and every voice has its has its place. And I think, Kim, one of the things I, I love about your platforms is uh, you, you, you give people that sort of freedom. So uh, what, tr what trauma do you see in me and how can I, how can I, <laughs> no, let's save that for another day. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's save okay. that for another day. Um, I want to say hello, everybody. And thank you all for being here. And thank you. Yeah. Hi, Elise. I look forward to connecting and hearing. Hello. Um, oh, gosh. So I'm going to weave and thread from quite a number of things that have gone on for me in the last 10, 15 minutes. I would say every new moment is a new Petri dish if we are present with it in that way. Um, there's, there's evolution is always happening. Some say change is a constant. I mean, evolution is just always happening and the opportunities are there. Um, that, that, oh gosh, there's so much I was playing with, with sacred freedom. First of all, what is freedom, you know? And, and, and then sacred freedom. Freedom in my way of being with, you know, an opportunity to, to speak what is true for you, not because you're gonna speak the truth because you need to get back at somebody. That's really not the truth. That's usually an avoidance of the pain that's going on underneath. Um, anger is pain's bodyguard. So we can have freedom to express, freedom to discover, freedom to love who we wish, freedom, freedoms. And then there's 
freedom if, are we going to be then in freedom when it's of service to the whole because i could say somebody could say well i just want to go out and kill whoever i want to okay god bless with everything that's going on that that to me doesn't doesn't fit as a freedom that also contributes to the whole of of life itself so so in the freedom to discover the freedom to play to the freedom to goof because earth school is always in session i mean you know we it's just part of the process um and are goofs really goofs or is that an in, is that a conditioned interpretation that really isn't of service anymore okay um to to ex examine when as far as words go when our body contracts when it expands because when it contracts or pulls in usually not the optimum is perspective is being expressed to continue to support expansion exploration etc so a little bit on freedom and then sacred freedom interesting my llc is sacred life living um sacred freedom adding the word sacred can be a linear connection to make even stronger my stand for what i want is freedom that's one way sacred freedom uh to help justify my request for these freedoms <clears throat> that's one a linear possibility sacred freedom or we could say freedom is sacred when we are with it in sacredness and when i connect that way my energy is very different when i be in sacredness so sacred freedom mm, for me there's greater depth and breadth and connection with and as the universe sacred freedom it's a beyond discovery of any linear dialogue it's a reception of the wisdom and collaboration with the wisdom of the universe of which we are all made um that expands the possibility and the journey and and can when the depth of listening also grows and the willingness to just trust sacred freedom and sacred freedom to give that to others in our collaboration with them in the listening with them in the presencing with others and this world that they too they are sacred freedom and so is all of life and when we go about that then there is a sacred or sacreding or sacrednessing um platform upon which everything just seems to become more magical potentially so i'll leave it with that at the moment oh, that feels so so wonderfully i'm calming that's beautiful that's the idea thank you <laughs> and i'd like to pull something out you said anger is pain's bodyguard um and that, that that is really so profound so let's let that simmer in there okay. elise um what is your perception of what sacred freedom means or is is freedom um different for you from sacred freedom and you raising three wonderful humans and i've read from your amazing facebook post some of the things that you teach them during this school year about being kind about so i'd love to hear your perspective on this well thank you um first of all just hearing everything that kim had to say resonates and my words will likely be very different and my energy may feel different but the idea is is the same um uh sacred freedom is to me such a vague concept and yet sacred to me is very simple it's just connection to source anything that holds me in connection um to however we define source and that's almost irrelevant to me um 
And freedom to me is uh, vulnerability and lack of judgment. Um, and I'm talking about personally when I'm at my best, not in my everyday, right? And so um, freedom to allow myself to see, for example, another human as another human who is equally loved by source as I am, regardless of the circumstance that we're in. So um, um, allowing myself to try to see whatever source sees in that person with that unconditional love and acceptance um, and um, just taking from Brene Brown, for example, um, the freedom to apply the most generous version of a story that I can to someone, particularly when I'm in conflict. So sacred freedom for me is relief, release, letting go, um, and holding space for a better possibility, um, just allowing for complete ease. Um, and I think sacred freedom is uh, kind of a shortcut. <laughs> it's, it's tapping in directly to source. I think there are many ways to find freedom, but I think that um, freedom, particularly in the U.S. these days, is this like hard fought, hard edge. I'm going to take care of my own. And to me, ultimate freedom is how does this serve the greater good? Um, and that's to me started with child rearing and not, not my kid um, is the best or gets the award or we're going to share this big thing on social media about this thing that my child won when there were 97 children who didn't. And how does that make them feel when we're all part of this community? We're, we're all supposed to be, I think, lifting one another up. So um, freedom is holding space for all of us to be human, all of us to be uh, spokes that are connected to the same hub. Yeah, I certainly love that um, because that, that resonates so much with me with the whole sacred freedom. And um, a lot of people would say, okay, so you believe in freedom. So um, that means anyone can do whatever they want to. And I guess for me, the concept of freedom and sacred freedom is so much the same thing, because it's not just doing whatever you want to. It's really doing whatever resonates and whatever's aligned with your deepest truth. And all of us have the potential to align with that deepest truth and when we're coming from that space, there is no, um, there, there, there is nothing that we do to be, um, to, to do something which would harm others because um, we're coming create to, we're coming into a sense of creating the world as we wish to see it, um, according to the greater good of our of our own hearts. Um, so for me, that 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 is a um, concept. But at least something you were talking about. Um, I remember uh, reading, or not reading, but um, hearing a, an audio of something Wayne Dyer spoke about when um, his eldest child was a kindergartner and she was learning to add and subtract, and um, she came home after learning to add and she said to him and I'm paraphrasing all this but she said dad I've got a gold star you know and it was for adding and he he says oh that's that that's great and she said look gold star and she was so focused on this and he said look I'm glad you learned to add and that's the whole thing but really I'm not interested in that sort of thing it's a it's a gold star it it doesn't say anything about who you are he was giving her that message that it's not about that validation from an external um source and um, so she went back to school and she came home and she'd learned to subtract and she'd um, got a gold star, but apparently you could see where she'd taken, uh, you know, there was a little thumb mark and the gold star yeah. was pulled <laughs> off. And he, he said, what happened to the gold star? She said, 
I gave it back to my teacher and said she must give it to someone else because I'm not really interested in that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> right. And I think that's where it that's where it comes from. I remembered that story listening to his audio program making the shift. And I, I so believe that that's where our agency, our sacred freedom comes in, where we can connect to that. And it's not about anyone or anything else. So, you know, regardless of what, what's going on around us, we can feel that worthiness from inside and we can say, I am free to make a better world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it really feels feels like that. Um, and I'd like to go into another topic. And Tom, you and I have such great conversations about this, about um, what, when we're all different. And I think um, uh, we, we were having conversation about this, um, Kim, Tom, and I, uh, we were having conversation and we all saw things slightly differently. And I said, this is such a great thing um, where if we're seeing things differently and not experiencing this, things the same way, how do we um, look at a world where we all experience things um, differently and say, well, how do we come together in unity as a world? How do we come together in peace and actually find that commonality? Um, so why don't you start us off with that, Tom? <laughs> You used such a great phrase earlier uh, in the previous session uh, when you welcomed everybody and you said, you're not going to, you said something like, you're not going to be this person again. Welcome to you or the version of you who is not likely to be here very long or something like that. And that, that meant a lot to me. We're ever becoming and we're ever regenerating. Uh, and I think we're always, uh, not, not a lot of the rewards, you don't get a gold star for forgetting who you are today, right? Not a lot of the awards are given out for that. The awards are given out for uh, be, be better than that guy over there, right? Get more than that guy over there. Take something from that guy over there. And uh, I would offer, I think, the sacred freedom is I am you. You know, we can all meet each other in the, in the eyes today and know that uh, in the spirit world, in the world of uh, we are, we really are all one. And this is just my accidental distillation for today. You know, and uh, this accidental distil distillation of Tom might last 150 years. Uh, and I'm, I'm playing for that, by the way. I was at my 35th <laughs> college reunion last week, and I was joking with everybody that I was going to be there for the 135th. Right. Um, the, uh, the mid forties guy 15 years ago, uh, that looked like a doc that didn't know how to take care of himself. Didn't speak, wouldn't have done that. Right. But we do get better and younger and stronger. And, uh, so I'm living proof, you know, I, I had gray hair, uh, mid forties. I was, so anyway, we do get younger and stronger. And so we, and we do become something else like and we become something else when I, when I can look over there and say, I am, wow, I'm, I'm that over there too. If, if only for just as, you know, with a slight shift of circumstance, the universe would have been over there. And we, we also tend to stratify, you know, I, in my next life, I want to come back as, right. But that's ego driven too. That's, that's uh, that's in a better, worse than you know, who got the award? We all got the award. What if what if we all got the award, right? I love the way Steve said it yesterday when, when he said, uh, uh, "Look what the universe has done. Look what the universe has done." And it, it's, I think everybody on this platform speaks that so powerfully. And thank you for being people like that because we can carry those messages that say, uh, wow, the universe did this, cool. Uh, even when it's stuff that's not going well, right? So I think maybe that's the question, something like that. Um, how? What's your favorite way of turning the prism 
what's your favorite way of accessing um, the the uh, the I I am you ness? So why don't I toss it to Elise? Um, I am Elise. And what's your what was what would be your favorite way of both to let's do it let's do it twofold um, your own personal favorite way of turning your prism and your favorite way of describing that dynamic uh, in you know it, it, to somebody in your life who's struggling and you know it you know a better way as you're shepherding them out you're helping shepherd them. Mm. Um... I, it, it, you know, it all comes back to connection for me. So um, when there is a struggle, I know that I am not in alignment with my greatest self. I am ego driven instead of tuning in. And I have faith that this experience is happening um, in order for me to plant seeds of better moving forward so that when I come through this, I will be more evolved in a better position, um, more connected to my own truth until it cycles again. And I need that, that lesson again. Um, I hope I'm making sense. This is, um, thank you, ladies. <laughs> um, and let me interrupt you maybe that's a great opportunity to say what if you're not what if what if, what if yeah what, what if, if I'm not making sense yeah what if you uh were given the opportunity to know for real that nothing that's coming out of your mouth right now is nothing what you wanted yeah and and what would you how would you give yourself forgiveness oh, and you are making you are making perfect sense but um thank you um there's that there's the condition that i needed right <laughs> no. um how i i am so pure and crystal clear on my intentions of being here with all of you today that if i'm not making sense someone else will um and something that someone hears from today will be helpful and something that i experienced today will be helpful to me and i will learn from it so uh, oh, well, <laughs> is my response. Yeah, beautiful. Um, yeah. And then um, in terms of other people, I think there are two things. In terms of myself with someone else, um, I have to keep coming back to Marianne Williamson's deepest fear quote. And at the end, how... Um, it, not playing life small and allowing ourselves to thrive in our connection and thrive in our flow. And when we catch it and we hit it and we're on, um, that we can be a light to others. Um, so, so number one with someone else is, um, I love you and I'm not going to jump to the vibration that you're on right now. Because if I go down to where you are, you'll feel temporarily better. But in the grand scheme of things, I'm not sure that you'll vibrate any higher from this. Um, and, and to just be a listener, be a sponge and a mirror. So um, my best self is... Um, understanding and hearing what's happening with that person who may not be vibrating where he or she needs to be and who may not be connected to his or her full truth right now. There's probably a lot of storytelling going on. So, um, you know, listening, validating, but not um, reinforcing or enabling um, because I don't I know when I'm in a not so great place, I want someone to join in with me and say, yeah, you know. Um, and the most frustrating thing is when someone shines light on where I potentially could be if I were more connected to my sacred freedom, to all that is good, to the greater good. Um, and so um, letting go of judgment, understanding um, that we all 
land in these different places at different times and we're all connected. But just because we're all connected doesn't mean we have to vibrate at the same level as someone who's who is wishing us to. Um, yeah. Can, can yeah. I just um, ask you something quickly? Can, if, if you don't mind, could you just share, I remember you once sharing um, on social media about what what you do for your kids the first day of school. Oh. Or... <laughs> sure. So they're now uh, 19, 17, and almost 13. So they roll their eyes at me now when I do this, but I know that their ears are open. Um, Glennon Doyle, uh, the, the blogger, and now she's a motivational speaker and stuff. Um, she wrote a piece called Dear Chase. Uh, back when her little boy was going into third grade and it was the night before school started. And it just talks about how um, when she was a little girl, there was a boy who was picked on and that Glennon didn't speak up and that there was an inner voice telling her to, but that she was afraid. And so to please, when you go to school tomorrow and you're among all these new uh, friends, to see each and every one of them as a gift and to unwrap that gift and understand that person. And um, basically, if the children see anything happening that is unkind or disrespectful, to speak up, to find their voice. If they don't have the voice to say it to the bullies, find an adult, come home and tell their parents that um, just kind of Basically, you know, we're all here to walk one another home and just sending children off to school with a mindset that we're all here to take care of each other. And that's how I, whether my kids had a brand new outfit for school or, you know, a clean, fresh hairdo or super white sneakers, I'm not sure they had that every year. In fact, I'm sure they didn't, <laughs> but they went to school knowing that they were there to take care of one another and not to get, get the A plus on the spelling test, which, which is, a, by the way, a side effect of taking care of oneself and taking care of each other, that that, that stuff happens organically. Um, having taught for 16 years, um, another big piece of this, we're all in this together. The, the classroom is its own little, um, and I loved listening to hear Kathy, the segment before us talk about um, our words, but even something as simple as the teacher saying, not saying, tell me, Ba, 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 but saying share with us xyz um it just just um who we are and understanding our place in the bigger picture um is so rich longing to be drawn into the big story yeah somebody in the previous session was using the phrase allurement and uh in the deep time principles that means a lot to me that that being part of, I don't have the quote, I don't have the attribute uh, who said this, but somebody, the, the quote is, if the young men aren't initiates, they will burn down the village to feel the warmth, right? If they're not wow. part of, yeah, then, then the natural instinct is mm -hmm. autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. Right. I always have to bring it back to the patholo physical pathology. <laughs> yeah. If the thing isn't serving me or if I don't feel part of it, Mother Nature properly just has properly sets the instinct in me to destroy it. Right. So we're seeing this violence. We're seeing this rash of uh, what you might call social autoimmune disease. Right. Homicidal ideation suicidal ideation, violence, uh, huge numbers uh, increase over the past decades, centuries, couple of generations. And why? Because we're disenfranchising. We're, we're uh, separating people from having agency, that sovereignty that we talked about in the previous session, where you're part of and where, where I am you and where we are going to find Right. When, when you can do the shrug and say, oh, well, right, we are going to find it together. Right. And when people know that and they can be there in that kind of a community, in that kind of a tribe that knows there is there is a tomorrow. It's just 
uh, we, we have to be here right now. And we all have to be real honest and interdependent and vulnerable and transparent like that. And then all of a sudden something emerges. But if that's not there, uh, we got to burn the village down. Yeah, that's amazing. Kim, what are your thoughts about sacred freedom and peace? And how do we build the village up instead of burning it down, going from the place we're at now? I think it's uh, my, my, the answers that start coming with the asking of your question is it's, it's an inner, I could say work, an inner opportunity of, of continual evolvement and recreation, awareness, choice, um, honesty, um, and sometimes uh, honesty I find can bring clients more into being actually accurate with what's going on, truth, Sometimes I find people can declare a truth when they're not really connected all the way in. It's very interesting. Um, and then being being honest um, and present. And at least when you talked about connection, um, uh, a man in his work that I really love, um, Gabor Mate, has uh, a video out about what the what the problem you know where the challenges are stemming from. And um, when we are able to become disconnected, I mean, the connection is always there. We couldn't be walking around, right? So when there is a diminished connection, I could say, it can be experienced as a disconnection, if that makes sense. Um, then all kinds of things. I think it's been beautifully shared with many of us on the call here, that then whatever you're not connected with, you can hurt. It's very easy to do that. Um, and and I, I had a young man, not mine, but um, I sublet a couple rooms in my home and, um, and a very kind human being and the gym and computers and games were very much a focus. And he thought he intellectually understood when I talked about the value of going for a walk together or, you know, but he didn't even have a way or a wiring to understand what he wasn't aware of. He could think himself into believing that he was aware and yet wasn't aware. And when we don't grow up spending time in nature and thinking of the whole and connected to the whole, then it's very easy to hurt and harm and uh, out of separation. Something else that I did wanna bring in is to understand I have a body and I call myself an I, we're a habit calling myself an I, um, and yet I'm a collective. I couldn't exist without a lot more than we've probably ever known. It's coming forward that, you know, they're asking questions of, am I, you know, are people really human because they thought there were human cells? Well, I think it's all a collective. So my toe, gratefully, has a different perspective and experience than my ear. And I'm really grateful that my liver doesn't have an identity crisis and try to become my heart, because it should be something else. I'd have a really challenging day. So, so repeat your question again, and I'll hone it, I'll rein it in. Repeat your question again, Hasina. Interesting that I actually remember my question because I was so um, in the moment with you. But um, how do we? So how do we build the village instead of burn it down? I, I would it? say bringing together everything to really, at least what you were talking about, the kids going to school, to to know that anger is pain's bodyguard, to see if somebody is really being disconnected. They're really asking for a connection, but it likely was never safe and they don't know it, um, to be, be, a, be, be that, be the place of peace, and yet also have boundaries and containers and a willingness to understand and to welcome. And your amazing 
And maybe you don't even know how amazing you are. I will, I'll share this story. There was a, a young man at the entrance to a supermarket. <clears throat> and I was walking toward him and I he had a bag, I looked like a bottle in a bag. My sense, I don't know for sure, my sense was he was possibly homeless and potentially had alcohol in, in the bag. And, and I, my sense was he was going to connect and ask for money. So I pulled out a dollar and rolled it up in my hand and just allowed it to be there. So it didn't look like I was holding. It just hopefully was there and I could choose. And I walked up to him because we were going to cross paths and walking in unless I really avoided him, which I didn't feel like doing. So I walked up to him and smiled and we looked each other in the eye and I said, hello. He said, hello. And I said, could I, would it be all right if I asked you a question? And he said, yes. And I'm probably paraphrasing, but it went something like this. Would you be willing to come to know all the gifts you were designed to bring to this world since you were born? Would you be willing to do that? And he said, yes. And I said, as you do that, would you be willing to begin to live them into this world? Because you are of great value, even if you may not feel like it much at the moment. Would you be willing to do that? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, here. There are, we could do that with ourselves in the mirror. We can do that. It's the opportunities. Um, the standard stuff, wishing it somebody a happy birthday. And I don't have access to it. It would take a moment and I can, I can pass on finding it. But I went where and how in doing what I normally do throughout my day, can I make a bigger difference? How can I help others wake up? Not because I think they should or that they're not, but because it's a gift to come to know yourself and the amazing world we live in even more. And so I started writing these happy birthday messages to the day of your birth that is celebrated in the universe. And I'm just paraphrasing right now. That is celebrated in the universe every day of every year because you arrived to give the gifts you came to give, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the difference in energy and the responses that I get. So who can we be with ourselves and with each other with stuff that we normally do, you can add new things, that's great. And yet there's that miraculous opportunity in likely so many things we already do every day mm -hmm. to live exactly what you're asking. That's, yeah, that's brilliant. And I know we're at the end, so um, <laughs> any, any, um, 10 second messages from everyone. Um, Tom, uh, Elise, Kim, our 10 second messages, someone start. <laughs> and second message is there is no end. There is okay. encounter, express, embody. Encounter, express, embody. You're all amazing. Yes, Feel you are. Let it grow. Live it, be it, ignite it, receive it, and see it in others, even when they may not, and in all of life around us, even looking at a map or a picture, exchange it and enhance it every day. Great. Elise? Oh, gosh. Uh, there is enough of everything for everyone. Um, and uh, love and fear cannot coexist, and love liberates. Oh, it's great. And I would say just for everyone, for everyone to just um, be still and say, I am an expression of the universe. It's so empowering just knowing who you are 
that you're not alone, you're part of the greater whole, I am an expression of the universe. Um, thank you so much, um, everyone being here, Elise, Kim, and co-hosting with Chum, always a joy. Um, I think we co-created something where we had moved from the points that we had, but this was what it needed to be. And just want to thank everyone in this energy space. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for your sacred listening. Um, I will stop thank the recording. Thank you so much, Asina. Yeah. Let's present our next guest as well. Uh, how to reset your vibes so you can reset your results using law of attraction. Michael will be teaching how to get high quality results. Uh, I was gonna stop uh, after Michael will be teaching how to get high, but no. Uh, <laughs> Michael will be teaching how to get high quality results through proven knowledge about law of attraction. And he's been delivering online training seminars and workshops since, since 2008 with Teleclass International. So stick around. Thanks everybody for being here. And Kathy, yours. Good to see you. And we need to stop the custom live streaming, please. There we go. Let's go. Off. Still on. Still on. Oh, how, how do we? Oh, must I? Yes. yes.